asked. Are you living with purpose, passion, and making a difference in your life's journey? Well, you've come to the right place. The X Factors to Success Podcast Radio Show. Great day to you all and welcome to the X Factors to Success Podcast Radio Show. I am your host, Ruggiero Fratarcangeli, also known as the G-Man, as you all know. And today, uh, we have a special guest on the X Factors to Success. But before we bring him on board, I'd like to remind everyone that the five major pillars of the X Factors to Success, faith, family and friends, fitness, finance, and fun. And those key pillars will guide you in the direction of success, joy, and happiness, and really achieving your purpose, 100% responsibility for your purpose. And uh, I'd like to also open up with a quote here today, an inspirational quote by Gary Ryan Blair. Success in any endeavor does not happen by accident. Rather, it's the result of deliberate decisions, conscious effort, and immense persistence, all directed at specific goals. So what are your goals here, folks, today as you listen up to a very special guest? So our guest here is a doctor, Dr. Nick Eberl holds a Ph.D. from the Free University of Berlin and a postgraduate diploma from the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Nick headed the Net Promoter Scorecard Research Project on South Africa's destination branding success story during the 2010 Soccer Cup. And he's the co-founder, uh, co-author of the World Cup Brand Ambassador Program and co-founder of the Fan World Cup. Dr. Nick is the author of The Seven Secrets of Ezekiel, Conquer Life, a uniquely South African life skills program, and a must for anyone, everyone, and anyone who wants to overcome career and personal challenges. The sequel, Impi, Impom Vu, hopefully I pronounced it correctly, Innovate or Die, was okay. introduced to the international media at the Global Leaders Summit, sharing the platform with leadership gurus, Tom Peters, Rudy Giuliani, Michael Porter, and many more. That the next book, Brand Ovation, How Germany Won the World Cup of Nation Branding, was featured extensively in the local and international media worldwide. In addition, he is a co-founder and executive chair of the Future of Leadership Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome my guest and your guest today on this podcast, Dr. Nick Eberold. Dr. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ruggiero. Tante grazie, and it's a great honor and privilege to be hosted by X Factors. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for taking your time. And uh, I know that uh, we are about the six, seven hours difference from the United States, uh, my studio here, to where you are. You lo you're located down in uh, in uh, Johannesburg, correct? Johannesburg, South Africa, and we are going into winter, so it's getting colder. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's a right, it's a Sasan tip of the world. One day I will make a point to uh, have it on my bucket list to visit uh, Johannesburg, uh, Cape Town, and uh, uh, and down also there's an island of Mauritius. Is also a uh, a fellow uh, colleague of ours, also Mr. Sarans Rutherpeth, that uh, he was the one responsible to our uh, rendezvous here to be on the show. So I want to thank him uh, as well. Yeah, well, it's very good to be on your show, and I really love your five Fs. Well, thank you. key success pillars. Yes, and I know there's a lot of success that you have brought to the world in the last 20, 30, 40 years, Doctor. And uh, I, I'm so excited to hear more about you. I've been reading about you. I, I researched you. But there there was so much to, uh, to really uh, focus on uh, what you do. Can, can you give us a little bit more? I, I know I, I gave you a short little bio here. Uh, what else can you tell us about uh, a general overview on Dr. Nick here? Well, by trade, I'm a historian. I actually did my PhD on the Roman Emperor Nero, Nerone. But I, I, uh -huh. discovered, I discovered a writing from the 16th century written by Girolamo, Girolamo Cardano, which was called Elogio di Nerone. And I spent many years researching the true image um, the brand image of Emperor Nero, and it turns out that he was actually a good emperor, that he didn't wage any wars, that he abolished the gladiatorial tax, uh, gladiatorial games, and that he tried to abolish income tax. And that's when the aristocracy and the military turned against him, and unfortunately, 
these are the guys that wrote the history. So as mm -hmm. a historian, when I came down to the University of KZN in Durban, South Africa, okay. 25, years, 25 years ago, I discovered the legacy of King Shaka, the famous Zulu warrior king. Yes. And I spent many years researching the innovation strategies of King Shaka, how he grew his empire 10,000 times in 10 years. Wow. That's uh, interesting uh, research and deep uh, understanding the strategies. And I, I understand from your work and your research, you've also incorporated these strategies in today's business world, Dr. Nick. Is that true? Very much. I teach these strategies to businesses, and I implement them in my own business. And I'm currently uh, operating a number of startups that I, I am marketing and building according to these innovation strategies of King Shaka. Interesting. I know that uh, our, uh, um, actually, uh, Mr. Sarans, who is also my mastermind, uh, one of my mastermind groups that I have, he's a mastermind partner, and he, uh, I believe he was at one of your uh, events just recently, a few months ago. And he spoke, That's right. I was he spoke very highly of you and uh, some great uh, insights on, on marketing and branding and achieving success. And I'm looking forward to hear about it. And my audience would like to hear more about it because we have a very diverse audience, Dr. Nick. And right. it expands worldwide. And I see all the uh, guests who come over and listen to the shows. And you're going to be a very interesting uh, interview here today. So let's let's get right to it there, Doctor. So, Dr. Nick. Thank you. Uh, I know that the, my, my X factors to success how would you define success in general from your point of view and all your research you've done with the various different his historic uh, events um, in the world? Well, as a historian and as a historian who spent many years researching the history of Africa, I would like to use a concept that Nelson Mandela, who is turning 100 years this year, yes. Nelson Mandela called the definition of success actually Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a Zulu word, word, and it means helping others. It actually literally means people are people because of people, but it means helping others to achieve what they want to achieve. So that's how I would define and encapsulate the principles of success. If you can live by the principle of Ubuntu and help others to achieve what they want to achieve. Well, it reminds me of... Um... It reminds me of a quote by Zig Ziglar uh, that really uh, resonates. And again, these uh, these philosophies and, and what you just said right now, if you are successful to help others achieve what they want, you will achieve what you want. It's in the same premises also, Doctor. Uh, exactly. Uh, wow. Interesting. I have to... Uh, so... All this here keeps you motivated. In the last uh, few years, you have uh, changed, and now, not changed, but you have shifted your, your trajectory on really inspiring the world around you. What motivates you now with this, all these teachings and, and branding? And as, you, as I said in your bio, that you also uh, very influential in the uh, World Cup soccer back in 2010 and uh, getting the success in uh, soccer, World Cup soccer in Africa as well. How would you... Describe your motivation. Well, my motivation is really encapsulated by two, I call them emotivators, by two emotional motivators. Yes. The one is connection, and that is to connect with others, to connect with other human beings on a face-to-face -face basis, uh -huh. deep connection. And the other one is contribution, to contribute to the well-being and to the success of others. Um, and looking at the work that I've done for the Soccer World Cup, and that I'm now doing for the Fan World Cup, right. it's really a lot of it. And my motivation comes from a deep desire to unite the world. Uniting the world, I think that soccer can do that. And I believe that if we bring soccer down from the commercial soccer to the grassroots level, to the people, I think we can truly unite the world um, by using the simple language of soccer. I, uh, I can really uh, equate with that because I played soccer, football, here in the States for many, many years. When I came from Italy, I came as a little boy, and my father, obviously influential, he was a big fan of Lazio, of course, the uh, team in Italy, and I played soccer. And the unity, the strategies, the, 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 the challenges, but yet 
how 11 players will play on the field against other limit players creates this yeah. whole notion of, uh, of camaraderie. But when you have a World Cup soccer like we have coming this year in June, and yeah. Dr. Nick, unfortunately, Italy is not part of the World Cup soccer this year, very unfortunately, you know? I know. I know. Uh, and the United States also, I have to say. So uh, I guess I have to root for some other team, maybe, maybe Germany, maybe? <laughs> well, thank you very much. And let, let me remind you, yeah. when you won the World Cup in 1982, it was a miracle of Rossi. Yes, Rossi. You still remember Paolo Rossi? Paolo Rossi, the golden boy, el, el Palone d'Oro. <laughs> yes. And he was banned. He didn't play two years before. He played three or four games. He was involved in a betting scandal. He was banned. Yes. And there was only one person who believed in him, which was your coach, yes. your manager. Yes. I think his name was... Uh, it was Berzot. Berzot. Berzot, yes. Berzot, yes. And he had, the, he had the vision. And again, I guess what you're saying, going back to, to the whole strategy of the World Cup soccer, how soccer brings unity of all nations, how I associate it also like with Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi, big uh, a coach uh, from the soccer, uh, from football here, actually football, American football, and how he, he positioned his players to look more inside, to give and to perform to the ultimate and to have focus and when you have focus you have direction you have purpose and it inspires it's these stories of uh soccer stars like if i think back to 1990 when italy hosted the world cup uh -huh. and Schilacci. Schilacci oh, became and superstar. <clears throat> yes and again it was it was somebody that was not known before but in one world cup he literally inspired the world and I think that is a metric of soccer. So, so let's let's dive deep a little bit more on this here. So we talk about Scalacci and all these all these uh, players. What motivate? What do you think extracts them from not being known in the arena to being known? What do you think that the ingredients or the attributes to the success of a of a sportsman, even when it goes down to a, a business as well? Well, when South Africa hosted the Soccer World Cup in 2010. Yes. Um, I did a lot of research into miracle teams because at the time the South African team, Bafana Bafana, uh, didn't do well and everybody was concerned what would happen if they would not progress past the first round. So I was looking at what it takes for a soccer team to achieve a miracle. Um, and they're always, especially at World Cups, there's a phenomenon that I've coined the collective energy transformation. And that is when the team, the team connects with the desire of the nation. And when a player connects with the desire of the nation, then you get this collective energy transformation. For example, it happened in Germany right after the war, the first, the second World Cup, 1954. Right. Germany hardly had a team, but for some reason, the World Cup was played in Switzerland. For some reason, the German team was dying to prove that they could be world champions. Um, and they managed to, to win the World Cup because they had a strong desire coming from the nation and inspiring and motivating the team. Uh, so I think it has a lot to do with the collective energy. Collective energy, I like that. Collective energy transformation. So if I take now the example of the Italian team, an Italian team always, always participating in the World Cup soccer, on a personal note, I feel that when a team collects players from outside of the nation during the regular season, like Serie A season, and yeah. when it comes to the World Cup, these players go back to their country. It leaves that the, there's no there's no passion anymore. There's no there's a lack of passion right. for for playing. It's more monetary. More. I, I, this is what I feel. Do you see some truth to that, uh, Dr. Nick? Yeah, very much. In fact, if I think back to the World Cup 2006 that was hosted in Germany yeah. and won by, won by Italy, yes. also that team, the Italian team, had to prove, prove a lot because there was a big, I think it was also a betting scandal in, in, in Italy. <laughs> there was talk about relegating Juventus, yes. Juve. Yes, Juventus. Even, I, think, even, I think Buffon was Im implicated. And that team had to prove a lot. And they went on to win the World Cup. So I think there's always a challenge and adversity. 
that's how I believe great leaders are born and great teams are born wow. through adversity. Adversity. So speaking of adversity, I know we're talking about the soccer and how, again, the sport relates to success and how the sport can really develop again, a collective energy transformation, as you said. What are the big mistakes that uh, people make or even you made that, that allows you to also to, to excel in your type of work right now, doctor? Yeah, big mistakes. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with timing. Um, in fact, I was uh, trying to get the Olympics uh, to South Africa for yeah. 2024 um, because we hosted a very successful soccer World Cup in 2010. And when I looked at the Olympics, I found that there's actually a formula where the Olympics can very much like the Soccer World Cup can unite the nation and it can actually be run profitably. You can make a profit very much like Los Angeles, 1984. Right. The organizer made a good profit and they did fantastic marketing and PR for the company. It was a big success. So, uh, and I wrote a book together with the, about the Olympic legacy, together with the president of the South African Sporting Committee, Olympic Committee, um, analyzing the legacy of Olympic Games from 1960 to 2010. Oh. What it makes for a successful Olympic Games. And it took a little bit too long. It just took a few weeks too long. And we missed the deadline to table it to the South African government. Oh. When they saw the book, when they saw the book, they said we, sh we, we would have, it would have made a difference. But unfortunately, it was too, too late. So timing, uh. I believe timing is a big price effector. I'm going to twist this around. Yes, there right. can be mistakes, but don't we learn also from mistakes, Dr. Nick? Yeah, absolutely. We do learn. And we learn, uh, what I've learned is to figure in uh, deadlines and to start early. Deadlines. I know that we have a, a regiment process uh, that when you look at things, but I believe, and this is just my belief, my observation, that sometimes those mistakes, uh, failures, which I hate to use the word failure, is created because it's leading us in a different direction. It also puts us in a different situation in, uh, in, a, in a universal guidance. Do you believe in that? I believe in what I call universal alignment. And I do believe in, uh, in, in destiny. So, yeah, whenever one door closes, another one does open. Uh, I love yeah. that. Dr. Nick, what are, you, uh, what are you most grateful for in life lately? In all your, in all your teachings, in all your new uh, startups, what are you most grateful for? And, and, and how does it contribute to the connection and contributions philosophy of your life, as you mentioned earlier? Well, I'm very, very grateful for having encountered and met a mentor, probably the most influential mentor in my entire life. Um, I've known him for about 10 years. Two years ago, he um, roped me into a project. And since then, we've been working, collaborating closely together. And I'm learning from him a lot every single day. I'm learning about leadership. I'm learning about project management. I'm learning about relationship building. I'm learning about the future. And uh, that is a great blessing in my life. Wow. So people will always say, Dr. Nick, Ruggiero, uh, you're lucky. Do you think people are just lucky in their success as yourself? Well, you probably heard the saying before, and it's attributed to a South African golfing legend, Gary Player. Gary Player used to say, the harder you try, the luckier you get. <laughs> and, yes. And Julius Caesar, when the Roman troops were entering just before they entered Britain, yeah. Julius Caesar said, Fortis Fortuna Juvat. Fortune favors the brave. Yes. So I think you have to be brave. And uh, luck, yeah, there's always a little bit of luck, which has a lot to do with timing. But I think ultimately, the harder you try, the luckier you will get. Huh. So this reminds me of, uh, you said uh, Julius says going into the, uh, how about how about the Spartans? The Spartans 300. Were they, yes. th they were a very strategic group of, of men who fought legions, large legions. So how, That's right. how would you... Describe that uh, strategy and their success. Well, that's obviously attributed to the famous Battle of Thermopylae. Okay. Uh, and it, it, in my view, it certainly was not a matter of luck. It certainly was a matter of strategy. Mm. 
and selecting a very strategic spot where they could focus and leverage their small quantity of only 300 soldiers against the vast army of the Persians. So again, it was how do you leverage, uh, how do you choose the right strategy, and how do you uh, mislead your competitor? Oh, mislead your competitor. That's a strategy. Absolutely. Okay. T t t tell us more about that, Dr. Dr. Nick. Well, misleading your competitor, I think, it has a lot to do with what's called competitive intelligence, gathering intelligence about your competitor. Mm. For example, Uber, there have been, before Uber became big, there have been about 20 other Uber-related services, new ideas, innovations, startups. Right. But the reason why Uber succeeded is that they were very good at preempting their competitors. For example, there was one big competitor in London called Halo that had about 2,000 taxi drivers on in London signed up to the Halo app. R right, right. And they announced, they announced that they wanted to go into the U.S. They wanted to enter Chicago, Boston, certain, and right. that as soon as Uber heard about that, they set out to design a strategy overnight, a strategy that would help them to preempt the entry of Halo and help them to build relationships and, in fact, pivot their business model from exclusive, the black cars, the limousine, yes. to, to yellow caps. They did that overnight. They did it very quickly, and they did it based on competitive intelligence. So, obviously, with that, with that intelligence, you took, they took action. They took immediate action. They took action. Exactly. Oh. Now, this reminds me also as Airbnb. Airbnb, uh, it's another uh, company out there that uh, made some unique strategies, and, and now uh, they're so successful in a very short period of time. Well, that's interesting because actually Airbnb, as successful as they, as they are, they are not the leader in the online hospitality market. The leader is actually Booking.com, and what Booking.com has done is they, again, through in, uh, competitive intelligence, developed a model where they have now been able to optimize the customer experience on the Booking.com app. And Booking.com is making close to a million bookings, close to a million bookings a day. Wow. That's which means... Extraordinary. Which means it means they're generating somewhere, these figures are not exactly public, but they're generating somewhere between 10 to $15 million a day, Booking.com. Wow, that is Awesome, phenomenal. Yeah. So, booking. dot com. So interesting. Okay, what other uh, startup would you uh, say that you've done some research that you've seen that uh, it's about the the strategies and in achieving success? Well, uh, more recently, I would definitely say Tinder. Yeah, the matchmaking uh, um, service. Yeah, um, they have done something very clever. And that they started in a niche and they were able to figure out, I think they were exceptionally good, uh, good motivates human beings and except, except especially what motivates men online. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So I think it has a lot to do with these emotivators, with the human drivers and human desires. In fact, that's what the founder of Uber, Travis Kalanick, said this. He said they figured out what sets them apart is that they discovered a key human desire and they built a customer experience around it. It always comes down, down to the customer experience, right? The branding, branding, branding. What is about the, the emotional feeling that goes down inside the psyche? Uh, again, as no matter where you are in the world, right? We're all human beings. We have emotions. And I think that's, that's, that's a key factor to understand what's going to go subconsciously the wants and needs to a consumer, and it's all about the lasting, the lasting emotion, the lasting uh, impression for the product or services to come back and repeat again, to to, exactly. to utilize the product or service. Great, great discussion here. I love where, where this is going there, Doctor Nick, because uh, again, it's a different uh, interview today where your experience definitely exudes a passion. You have a lot of passion. Uh, Thank you. So these passions that you have. I know that you mentioned a few. Uh, who would you say your top three role models are that's driving you to uh, to make a difference in the world? Well, the first one was definitely my PhD, PhD supervisor, Dr. Bernard. Dr. Bernard, yeah. Who was, 
Dr. Bernard Fritzler. He was a very famous academic in Berlin. I was very fortunate to uh, be invited to uh, uh, do my PhD on Nerone uh, with Professor Bernard. Uh -huh. he, then, he then retired in Berlin and he was uh, invited to start up a new department at the University of KZN in Durban, South Africa. He called me out. He was in, my life changed dramatically just by the fact from by moving first, moving from Germany to Italy and then moving from Italy to South Africa. And that is all thanks to him. Wow. And uh, he had a massive, massive, massive influence on my life. The second one is my current mentor. Um, and he is a very successful businessman and he's a very a great philanthropic um, person. And I'm learning, as I said, and uh, he's opened so many doors for me. And the third one is a very good friend of mine and business partner, Rodney, who not only is a great businessman, but he uh, has three children. Yeah. Two of them are girls, and they became world champions at uh, dancing, belly dancing. Uh -huh. And the son, the son started playing baseball in Johannesburg. And we don't really have baseball in this country. It's not a national sport at all. Right. But he had a passion, and Rodney fostered his passion. And he took him at the age of 14. He took him to uh, to a clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. And for some reason, somebody discovered his talent. And today, Taylor is just one step away from breaking into the major league, oh. baseball league. Okay. And that has been all due, or a lot of it has been due to Rodney Ritt literally uh, dedicating his life to the development of his children. And he's he's done many he sacrifices, but he spent so much time and money and effort on building champions. I love Great it. Great inspiration. So this uh, this uh, young man, his name is Tyler. You saying Tyler? Taylor. Taylor Scott. Taylor Scott. He's with the Texas Rangers. Taylor Scott. Taylor Scott. Okay. Texas Rangers, and uh, I think he might be pitching tonight. He's a pitcher. Oh, I have to look up, look him up then, uh, Doctor Nick. Okay. He's two. He's two. Okay. Yeah, I'm a I'm a so so fan of baseball, but overall, I, I do watch. I, I mean, I'm in New York, so uh, when I came from Italy, I grew up in the Bronx. And the New York Yankees, oh. the Yankees were uh, are my are my team. So I was like oh, great. <laughs> 27 uh, world champions and uh, some great plays there over the years. Uh, again, talk about sports and dedication and coaching and mentoring, right? Great. So Dr. Bernard really uh, really had a breakthrough for you and uh, shifting from from um, from Germany to Turkey to Italy and to uh, into Africa there and making a big difference. Well, I now. think I think that's what great mentors really do they challenge you yeah. to take the next step he challenged me to take the next step to the phd i didn't really want to do the phd he challenged me to do the phd he said it will be very good i know you want to go into business it will help you a lot in business he challenged me to come out to south africa i was reluctant but he offered me an opportunity and again he challenged and i think that's what great mentors do right. they challenge you to to take the next step of success beautiful and, and so, Dr. Nick, your, your mentorship, how often do you get together with, uh, with your mentors? Do you have a, a specific uh, routine, yeah, well, it, behavior? It, it's, uh, it's actually not uh, a formal mentorship. What we do, we collaborate in business ventures. So uh, we collaborate on projects. Yeah. We become business partners. And uh, so many times it's on a weekly, if not daily basis. Okay. But as business partners, that's how I learn. Beautiful. You've uh, mentioned uh, in well, I have I mentioned in your oh, in the opening and bio, you have a book there called Brand Ovation. Yeah. Uh, again, this corresponds how Germany won World Cup nation branding. Can you uh, share some some specifics in the branding ovation that uh, you named this book here? Well, if you think about it, it's all about what happened in Germany during the 31 days of the Soccer World Cup in 2006. Because if you if you Remember, the brand image of Germany and the Germans uh, before the World Cup was really, really bad. Mm. Uh, German seen, I mean, how would you describe typically a German person? Typically, Germans were seen to be unfriendly. Yes. Cold, yes. distance, right? Cold. Uh -huh. Exactly. Boring and almost robotic. And what happened is the World Cup changed it overnight because the German people were die dying to prove that they could be friendly. Uh -huh. And uh, the, and again, it was a challenge. It was actually the German organizing committee 
that came up with the slogan, the brand promise, a time to make friends. They told the people, the German people, it is time, guys, to make friends. We're hosting the World Cup for four weeks. Please make an effort to yeah. make friends with visitors. Okay. And uh, and and it just it became viral uh, to such an extent that a million visitors had booked their trip to Germany to attend the World Cup because it turned into such a great party. Within two weeks, another million visitors from all over the world, the world flocked to Germany. Wow. And the the press and the PR was just phenomenal, and it really reinvented Germany's brand image to such an extent that even the economy, a year later, the Time magazine titled the head, right. the, uh, the cover, um, the German economy taking off record employment, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, tourism boom. So, I was so about to say that. Not, so tourism definitely increased because of all this. Tourism has increased. Tourism has doubled, doubled in this my hometown of Berlin. Oh, okay. And what it has done, you see, the brand of a country is really the brand of of the people. It's when you encounter somebody from Germany, what experience do you take away? What impression do they make on you? How do you encounter their behavior? And that has changed. The German people, in my view, have become a lot more friendly. And a lot more relaxed and a lot more welcoming. Indeed. I have um, experienced the 14 years of dedication with Volkswagen, uh, Volkswagen Audi here in, in, the, in the States. As I, I yeah. am a, uh, uh, an automotive executive, uh, I've done um, work with, uh, with Volkswagen as a, uh, uh, an area manager, a distribution and trainer, uh, representative, and uh, spent many years with uh, driving wonderful, wonderful vehicles. But the, again, they exude a, a, a sense of uh, Persistence, structure, alignment, very, very stout, and get to the point. And so what you're saying is this has been one of their challenges to make it more of a unique experience and open to the world that they are more open and warm. And they proved that they could be good losers as well because when <laughs> Germany lost – yeah. when Germany lost the semifinal to Italy, 2-0, yeah, yeah. if you remember. Yes, yes, I remember that. Everybody was sad, but – Nobody was fighting, and the Germans very quickly, within a few hours, uh, really turned around, and they were still welcoming and friendly. And they then called the team, the German team, they called it uh, World Champions of the Hearts. Weltmeister der Hearts. World because Champions they, of the Heart, okay. Uh, that became the brand of the new Germany. I love it. I have to look into this here. So the other book that you have, uh, your co-creator, you mentioned here. There's another book that you, uh, you the Seven Secrets of Ezekiel. Of Ezekiel. Yeah. Can yeah. you? How do you pronounce that? Uh, how do you properly pronounce that? Ezekiel. It's a Zulu word. Okay. It's a Zulu word. It means the short people. It refers to the Khoisan, the Bushmen, because King Shaka, before he became king, yeah, he observed the hunting behavior of the Khoisan, and he was intrigued to find that the Sen don't farm the land. They don't raise cattle. They purely rely on their hunting skills. And he was so impressed by their innovation and their ingenuity that he started a new regiment of young warriors. He called them Ezekwe. And he developed his innovation strategies in this regiment, in the Ezekwe regiment. And I've analyzed uh, these innovation strategies, and I've written a number of books about it, and I'm teaching these innovation strategies. Um, because they, he did 200 years. He did exactly on the battlefield what the modern innovators are doing in business today. Wow. The strategies of Uber, the strategies of Airbnb, the strategies of WhatsApp, King Shaka Zulu 200 years ago deployed on the battlefield. Interesting. Very interesting. I have to look into more this year. So I'm a little behind here, Dr. Nick. So I have to uh, get myself a hands-on. I'm also going to put these on the show notes for our audience to Thank you. check out also and, and to, I'll put all the links on the um, on the podcast and uh, I understand you are the uh, your founder and executive chair for the future of leadership forum can you tell us more yeah. about that and uh, are you doing these forums uh, there in Africa are you coming to the states give us a little more insight on that well this came really out of my LinkedIn work because uh, I've been teaching Ever since the World Cup 2010 in South Africa, when the World Cup was gone, I had to reinvent my business because my clients were gone, FIFA was gone, the sponsors were gone. 
And I, I then took to LinkedIn as a platform to grow my business and to grow my client businesses. And I was teaching the sales teams of IBM, SAP, HP, and others how to use LinkedIn as a marketing platform. Uh -huh. Now, as you know, on LinkedIn, you put up your profile, you grow your network, and then once you're connected with people, there the challenge becomes how do you now engage people? How do you go about marketing and selling on LinkedIn? Right. And that has always been the missing link. And in, in my view, the missing link comes down to how do you develop really deep relationships with your target market on LinkedIn? And I found this formula. In fact, I found it when I was doing all these interviews around the Soccer World Cup. I was interviewing guests yes. on the show on CNBC. And I found whenever we had a guest, an interview guest on the CNBC World Cup show, they were extremely grateful for the experience. So I started to develop the Future of Leadership Forum where I invite leaders, business leaders, public leaders, celebrities okay. to share their insights, to share their insights into the future of leadership. I publish very much like you. You, I publish these interviews. I turn them into a book, and I'm hosting the Future of Leadership Summit next year in Johannesburg, in February, oh, wow. for 100, 100 top leaders in South Africa. And then I'm leveraging the network to solve the big problems of today. For example, in this country, South Africa, every night, two million kids go hungry to bed. Now, mm -hmm. that is a challenge that I believe we can solve, thanks to technology. Yes. It all comes down to leadership. So I'm calling on these future leaders to come together for uh, an innovation hackathon, an innovation lab on creating technologies that can help us beat to to beat defeat child hunger and child poverty and ensure child safety you know that's this, a big driver i wow that's a that's an honorary um work you you're putting together here i mean this is for the again the your contribution to the world i mean you, you have a good heart there you've seen that what you're doing dr nick that uh, the world needs more of you uh more well i think that's what we're here for and that's where we I get that's my, the purpose. Go ahead. I think you and I and everybody on this planet has got one and just one job a job, and that is to elevate others. You know and that's why I'm saying yeah. No, I, I like to, you remind me of uh, become a teacher from people below you and become a student from people above you. And exactly. we're giving a gift. We're given a gift uh, on this earth for, uh, for a short period of time. We've got to share that gift and, and build build uh, momentum, be inspiring, be engaging, and be purposeful. And this is what I see from you, Dr. Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. It's a principle, it's a principle that I call reciprocation. Because if I can give you so much value uh, that you will be successful, if I can make you successful... One day, you will help me to become successful myself. I think it's as simple as that, reciprocation. It's amazing how we get we, we complicate things in business, even in life, everyday life. The people out there, I know, Dr. Nick, are walking without purpose, without understanding the principle of taking 100% responsibility. The word responsibility, able to respond to your emotions, to your events in your life. I know um, I'm a fellow, I'm a certified um, trainer with uh, uh, Jack Canfield, as I'm sure you, yeah. you know, and uh, know. The, the, the formula that he used and I, I use also in my discussions is E plus R equals O, events plus how you respond to the yeah. events will always eat, uh, ev um, equal the outcome. And uh, if we respond negatively and negative outcomes we get. When we respond Absolutely. with positive information, positive reaction, again, we're not blaming. For some reason, we always blame. We blame the government. We blame the, uh, the weather. We blame the taxes. We blame the, the lack of. So to your, to your um, goals that you, that you want to achieve is to feed over 2 million, 2 million children in, in your area, to, yeah. to give, them, give them comfort, give them basic needs. Um, exactly. Do you think this is a accomplishable in, in, in a short period of time or over time? No, it's very accomplishable because the United Nations are already doing feeding schemes. According to the United Nations, it takes just 50 cents. 
a day to feed a child. And if you extrapolate these 50 cents over a year, it's a budget of 4.2 billion rand, um, which is something like $350 million a year. So it's extremely achievable. All it needs is a concerted effort and leadership. Now, in today's, I, I know that uh, we're talking about success and, and achieving, being motivated. There seems to be so much um, unrest in countries all over. And uh, I know that uh, I know this is not a political uh, arena here. Countries with unrest create this stirring of, um, this stirring of uh, not knowing where they're going. And the people in the countries are, are disappointed as far as the quality of life. Where are we going with this? What, in your point of view, well, where, where are we going with this? Where are we going? I think it's very simple. Um, and I think we, the reason why there's so much unrest is that people are sensing that we're living in the interim. This age, this era of ours is an interim between the old era of monetization where you spend all your life and all your efforts on making just enough money to pay for your house, to pay for your car, and whatever else you need, and the new era uh, of true freedom, because we now have the technology to provide the more advanced human rights uh, for free. I'm talking about the right for housing. 3D printing houses for $4,000. Mm-hmm. A three a concrete house, a nice concrete house for $4,000. So as the costs are coming down, we will be able to provide... A, with free housing, with free transport, with free food already. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. With free food already, thanks to the increased efficiencies in food production, the food, the cost of food should be coming down a lot more. Uh, free health. We all will be able to live until 120 years. Thanks to technology, we will be able to live to 120 years as long as you look after yourself. So the big question is then, how are we going to spend our time? Right. How are we able to spend our time? Well, with all the food production and all the, you know, the the population growing on a world level, the, the production of food has become compromised, Dr. Nick. And there are, again, as we people see, diseases, cancers, and all different ailments out there, which are created by, again, this artificial preservatives and foods and the chemicals in, in our body, which come from the food intake. How would you, uh, how would you de- react to that? Well, for example, let's just take medicine. In a few years' time, we'll be, we'll be able to insert certain neurosensors into your body that will send out signals long before a disease breaks out. So a lot of the medicine will be changing, transforming from corrective to preemptive. So before any disease can develop, we will know about it, we will be able to preempt it, we will be able to keep you healthy, and we will be able to keep you healthy for a long time. Um, So in my view, what is most important is How? The question is, how are we going to stay productive once we turn 60, 70, 80, 90, and maybe 100 years? You know, this reminds me of um, uh, those seven countries or seven locations around the world, the the Blue Zones. Those These Uh indigenous areas we call Blue Zones. Like we have one in in Sardinia. There's one in in Japan, California. They are living past 100, 110, 120. And, and these are these are communities which have a unique lifestyle. Absolutely. And um, wh- what do you think that is a contribution of? Why are they all so unique? I think, in fact, it has been proven that community, the ability to connect with other human beings, is a key factor to emotional and physical well-being. So I think uh, to connect, to live in a community to contribute to others, um, the human elements will become more and more important, especially now that we live in a in an in an era that's driven by technology. Right. Well, look, um, right now you and I are are speaking through this video, and you we're we're thousands and thousands of kilometers away from each other, and we are able to uh, 
communicate effectively? Well, it's fantastic. But what would be even better if you were here and there's a nice restaurant restaurant <laughs> called Pizza e Vino. Pizza. If we could share a pizza, Pizza e Vino. Dr. And Nick. if we could share. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. And same here. When you come to New York, I will bring you to a uh, ristorante italiano, uh, authentic italiano Not here. You. you know? Dr. Nick, this has been a pleasure, uh, a pleasurable interview today. Uh, you and I, uh, and you have a lot to offer, a lot to give, and we touch base on a lot of different subjects and, and uh, areas of uh, a world contribution. As you talk about con connecting and contributing, uh, collective energy and transforming, your work is uh, is vast. It's it's beautiful to, to see that you are a human being giving back to the world. So I, I know we have a little more time here. I got a few questions before we say farewell until next time. Uh, what uh, what book inspired you, or what books one or two books inspire you, and you could recommend to the audience? Well, there's certainly one book that's called The Mandela Way by Richard Stengel, who is the editor or used to be the editor of Nelson Mandela's autobiography, and he has synthesized his experiences, leadership experiences with Nelson Mandela in this book, The mm -hmm. Mandela Way. Great book, very inspirational. Another book, a more scientific book that I've enjoyed a lot recently is called The Iron Myth, which is about the real image of King Shaka, the famous Zulu King Shaka by Dan Wiley. Okay. Um, and then a book that I enjoy very much from Bob Burke, an American best-selling author, is called The Go-Giver, which is really a, a business book uh, why you about why you should become a go-giver, how you should change yourself from a go-getter into a go-giver. Go-giver, right. You know what? I listen to his podcast very often, and he's a fabulous man, very, very even-keeled. And uh, yeah. a matter of fact, I picked up this book. It's on, in my library, and I have not read it yet with many other books as well. Great. Thank you for that recommendation to the audience. Uh, Dr. Nick, I like to ask this question to you, and uh, and I ask this question for, to everyone, and I've been asked this question many, many, many years ago, and I always had a big thought about it. So, if you were conducting this interview, what one question would you ask yourself, and why? Well, the one question I would ask myself is a question that I always ask delegates when I conduct my workshops, my innovation workshops, and that is, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? And which animal would you aspire to be? So if I were an animal, I would probably be a Jack Russell. You know the dog Jack Russell? Yeah, Jack Russell, yeah. Because I'm very inquisitive. I'm always on the move. I always sort of look for new ideas. And I would like to be, the animal I would like to be is an eagle because I enjoy my freedom and I enjoy going up into the sky and having this big picture view. I love it. And eagle is mine too as well. You soar above the skies, and, and you really uh, yeah. uh, look at the large, big picture. And, and the eagle is also a representation of uh, here in the American, uh, uh, in, in the United States. We use the eagle as uh, an eagle holding yeah. the uh, the uh, uh, the olive leaves and the uh, the thirteen arrows. There's a very significant about the eagle. So very interesting. A Jack Russell and the eagle. Yes. Wow, Doctor Nick. If, uh, let's just say now, it's 150 years from now, what legacy or imprint to the world will you leave behind and why? I think I would like people to remember me as somebody that, for one, has been trying to rewrite history and especially rewrite the history of the African continent and the Zulu Empire and the Zulu Emperor King Shaka. And secondly, somebody who has made an impact to alleviate child hunger, to alleviate child poverty, and to improve child safety. Well, rewrite history, the Zulu uh, emperor, and uh, child hunger. And that's a big, big step there to, to, to accomplish there. And I know that you, you're doing it with uh, with great efforts and uh, great uh, business associations and, with, uh, and your leadership form. So... Your forum. When are you going to conduct this forum again? Uh, just for the audience there, if should they be in, uh, uh, interested to listen up and find out more about it? 
Well, I'm I'm posting interviews every week. In fact, uh, I already have about a hundred interviews on it. Yeah. If you go to www.thefutureleadership.com, thefutureleadership.com, okay. and the summit, the Future Leadership Summit, will be held in February in Johannesburg. Beautiful. So that leads me to this here, Dr. Nick. Where can the audience find you? So give us a little bit of insight as far as your website, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Where can we go more, learn more about you and uh, where the audience can maybe email you, ask you questions, and uh, uh, connect with you? Well, the best platform, the one where I'm most active on is really LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. And uh, if you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Dr. Nick Ebel, um, I'll give you my handle. That is the easiest and the quickest and best way. Beautiful. And I'll put this in the show notes, Dr. Nick, uh, so the audience can click on there and uh, send you connecting. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, time with, with Dr. Nick here. And uh, he's uh, full of knowledge. He's like a, uh, uh, academia and, and a PhD. I mean, he's uh, really uh, making a difference in the world around him and the community. And he's got some great things happening. So check him out, uh, connect with him, send him an email, and see where can uh, he can assist you in uh, – uh, elevating your your X factors to success. So, Dr. Nick, would you like to uh, say any uh, lasting, uh, uh, last comments or inspiring encouragements for the audience before we say goodbye? Yeah, I think I would like to leave the audience with the three words. Again, the three words that Julius Caesar, Caesar used to inspire his troop, which is Fortis, Fortuna, Juvat. Fortune favors the brave. Wow. That is a powerful, powerful ending there. So, Dr. Nick, I want to thank you very, very much for taking your valuable time to be on the X Factors to Success. So I want to applaud you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tante uh, grazie. Grazie, grazie. I know that uh, when you speak Italian, it's amazing that the time you spent in Italy and you still remember uh, a parlare italiano. Bravo. So, thank you. Uh, are there going to be any opportunities for you to be in, uh, in America, in New York area, by any chance? Uh, well, I might be coming to San Diego. And if I do, then I definitely let you know. I know it's on the other side of the coast, yeah. but I would love to come to the Big Apple. And uh, yeah, hopefully soon, hopefully next year. Perfect. So Dr. Nick, I um, too are planning to put a uh, X Factors to Success leadership uh, uh, program here in New York in 2019. And I'm just, right. I'm thinking out loud and uh, you will be a perfect guest to be a keynote speaker to talk to the entrepreneurs in this side of the New York area. Um, and I just want to just plant the seed uh, with you that uh, Thank you. I'd like to uh, extend an invitation once I decide and how I decide to, to formulate this here to have you on the show, uh, to have you on the uh, uh, X Factors of Leadership uh, Conference. Yes, I would gladly come. And yeah, perfect. I would love so, uh, Dr. Nick, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. I bid you a wonderful continued success. I look forward to connect again in the future, maybe be on the show again. And since this is a, a brand new uh, podcast show that goes worldwide, I hope the audience today have uh, gained some knowledge, some insight of Dr. Nick here and uh, look him up, contact him, ask him questions. He's a scholar, definitely a man of, uh, of a lots of wisdom and, and experience. So without further ado, Dr. Nick, have a wonderful day, have a wonderful month and a year, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Same to you. And tanti saluti. Ciao, ciao, arrivederci. Uh, as we always say, the G-Man here says, live with purpose, passion, and make a difference.